Clubbers, hope you're dancing in your seat. It's that time to dance and also talk about books. We're talking about the Malazan Book of the Fallen by Steven Erickson, and we are on book four, House of Chains. I'm Jeff Kanata. I'm here with Lana Bashinsky. Hi, Lana. Hello. Good morning. Every time we dance to the song, I can feel myself wanting to like do the same actions, and I'm like, no, I refuse to choreograph the theme song. It's got to be stop, stop, stop. Anyway, yeah. good morning. Well, I mean, <laughs> at a certain point, dancing in your seat, you only got a, you only have so many moves. But <laughs> but I do appreciate the desire to choreograph. Maybe we should do a we for the final book, you know, for the final for book 10, we'll it's do like a got sing along with the ball on the bottom and then like <laughs> Here's the, here's how to do the DLC book club. <laughs> doing the book club. Oh boy. <laughs> Speaking of doing the book club, uh we got uh, we got two chapters to talk to you about this week, chapters 18 and 19 of uh, House of Chains. We are in the fourth novel, House of Chains, starting book 4 entitled House of Chains. So it's book 4 <laughs> and book 4. Eh, it's called synergy. Anyway, uh, but we always start the show with a non-spoiler topic. So if you're not caught up to where we're reading, you can still have some fun, you can still tune in every week and hang out with us. Uh, and I had a question that occurred to me this week. You know, I was, um, it has been said, Lana, mm. that one of the defining features of a fantasy novel, you know you've picked up a fantasy novel when the first page or maybe even there in the in the in the uh, in the in the insert and in the cover you find yourself a map mm. a map ah, i love a fantasy map and i wanted to ask you about it because we haven't really discussed maps i'm curious what is your feeling about the map mm. what is your level of reference with regard to the map, are you looking at the map? Are you checking when they say, oh, we moved into, uh, uh, we went to the other city and it's west of here. Do you go back to the map and go, oh, there it is, west of here. Uh, what, how do you, what is your feelings about fantasy novel maps? Fantasy maps, love this question. I'm into them. I love them. Even since like I was very, very young, I always used to say, I always know when I'm going to love at least the theme of a book when I open it and there's a map in the first couple of pages. I'm like, oh yeah, we're here. This is where I, I'm meant to be. I found a good one. Um, I do, I reference it. I, I love sort of getting the, the, the lay of the land. Uh, so when different cities are mentioned, going back and checking the map and seeing where things are. But let me tell you, pet peeve of mine. And I get it. I know why it happens. You don't exactly know literally everything about the book when you're going to make it probably. But what I... Or maybe it's like a Google Maps thing. It's just so zoomed out. But there's been many a book where it's like, here's the, the city that's referenced. And I'm like, I'm going to go check out exactly where that is. Not on the map. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, not that important of a city. Great. Next city's mentioned. Mm, check the map. Not on the map. Really? I, I've read tons of books where like the, the main city's mentioned. So at least like the, like the first few mentioned are not on the map. And it like disheartens me extremely because i'm like why do you put it here if i can't actually use it for reference because i will reference it i don't recall that ever happening to me but maybe uh maybe i i i do think that i um reference it less than i once did and i think that's mostly a function of reading on kindle mm. and it's a bummer to me that that's one of the joys of reading a physical paper to dead tree flip. book is you could just Flip, flip, flop. You pick up the book, you open it up. Ah, oh, there's the map. Let me. I'm just going to check in on the map. Uh, I'm reading, reading. Oh, I can just hop over to the map. I don't feel that convenience. Yes, 
Yeah. It's not as uh, it's not as easy. And you know what? That's even the wrong word because I do think it's relatively easy. Uh, I just <laughs> I find it cumbersome. Yeah. Um, and I tend not to do it. In fact, this is a topic for a whole different day. But I don't even like. I think one of the things people love about a Kindle is that you've got you know, thousands of books there right on your fingertips and you could hop between multiple books. I never even do that. I don't like even going back to the main menu in a, in my Kindle. I like keeping it in my books. So when I open my little Kindle cover, my book is the, the page I left off on is right there. I like that. Oh, I, somebody going back to the main menu between reads, that person is a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're on my page because I thought you were going to say that was more normal than what I'm doing. But doesn't no. it, I see, I feel like that's the, uh, that's one of the selling points of a, of a digital reader is that, oh, you can read multiple books and you only have to carry one thing. And I'm just not that guy at all. Mm. I mean, I'm not that guy. I mean, I, I don't tend to read multiple books at a time anyway. I kind of get entrenched in one, yeah. but I, you know, I like to just, I love the fact that I open my little Kindle flap. And there's the where I left I off. Have a flap. Right there. I just like seeing the cover. Of oh, what you don't I'm have reading. a flap? No. I have a, I I have a flap that I, I decorated my flap. Oh, cute. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's that little guy? <laughs> That's my my friend. On, wow, this is synergy. This is art uh, by my friend JP Kuvert, who oh. also created, drew the map that's right behind me oh. that I did for my D&D campaign. Wow. It's framed and, right there in my uh, in my field of view or right behind me. Uh, and that was truly one of the biggest joys of um, of doing a, you know, a, a televised or streamed uh, D&D campaign was I got resources to like get a real full on cool looking map. Mm -hmm. uh, and by resources, I mean, I did it out of my own pocket. But um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the. Uh, I, I know that uh, Mr. Erickson talked about, he and um, uh, Mr. Esselmont talked about uh, the fact that they, you know, would start their campaigns, their tabletop campaigns with a map. And a lot of people do that. Um, but, you know, it was the first time that I got to like have an artist draw mine. And it's so satisfying to see a map and have it be beautiful and look like something that would be in a fantasy novel. Mm -hmm. Because I do think that is a joy. One of the first things when I pick up a new series, a fantasy series, you just look at the map and you're like, ooh, look at all these cool places that we're going to discover. And what does that icon mean? And well, what see, that now you put yourself out there because I'm like, if I recall correctly, one of the things that like sort of inspired Stephen and and uh, and Ian, Ian to yeah. sort of pursue their own campaign is because they went through the campaign and they're like, it just doesn't make sense. We have to make yeah, it yeah, make sense. Yeah. Would you put your map up for Erickson's scrutiny? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, no. In fact, I thought of that immediately when he said that. I was like, oh boy. <laughs> not ge geographically accurate, not, uh, uh, yeah, ge geologically accurate is really the word. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's fun. I did use a like a software program that generates, you can find a, like a free, there's a free software program that generates land masses mm -hmm. and tries to like put rivers you know, in the place that rivers would really be and mountain ranges in a place that mountain ranges would really be. So I, I don't know any of that stuff. So I just let the, <laughs> and then I just filled in names and, and moved stuff around where I thought it, it should be. But, um, I, but going back to the Kindle thing, mm -hmm. I do think there would be a cool feature and maybe there is a way to do this that I don't know about, but there, it would be a cool feature to have the map button, you know? So you yes. just like have a button that just pulls the map up at any given time. I, I would genuinely love that. I will say like going through this book series with you, I feel like it's made me a more uh, ideal like Kindle user, like more the target audience for <laughs> the Kindle in that I have started picking up, you know, reading short stories be between what we're reading um, to like sort of flesh out my reading time and going back now and like from highlighting things, like I was never the type of person to like highlight things in a book. Like that was one of the things I would see people do and I'd be like, yeah, it's hurting me <laughs> that you have done this to this beautiful thing. Um, yeah. And now, I mean, ever since my 
is is Cutter, um, do Jack or whoever is Cutter, <laughs> uh, uh, Durker thing. I'm like, oh, let's verify my facts before I just like make up amazing revelations <laughs> live on the show. Um, I'm like, I am going back and doing things more, and but referencing the map, other than like the first couple times the city was mentioned, I haven't done that as much. Um, yeah, because I do think it like is fall fallen away. But now that we're talking about it, I can just. Even though I'm like, it is cumbersome. I can feel myself already being like, now I want to go look at it. Like right now and look at all the little <laughs> things and see if there's anything new that feels yeah. cool to look at since the beginning. I love the style of fantasy maps too. I love mm-hmm. the like old timey uh, cartographer. You know, it's not it's not Google Maps, right? It's not, it's got this kind of artistry to it or yeah. um Repre- representative iconography to it that it's not it's not a one to one in size it's not you know it's not a it's it's got this kind of um abstraction level of abstraction and that's mm-hmm. one of the things that I had JP do with with the map that he did for our D&D is like big icons for the cities you know and kind of you know almost um almost to a point of being cartoonish. He's a, he's a great cartoonist. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't use that as a pejorative. I I love cartoons, but, but exaggerated and kind of, uh, bubbly almost. It's, um, I I love that style. It's very Tolkien, you know, it's very, uh, Lord of the Rings map, uh, which I love. I'm going to write a book and it's just going to be set in like modern day. And there's just going to be a Google maps of New York. I'm like just a link page. to Google Maps. <laughs> it's a QR code. Uh, it's yeah, it's a map, but like tastefully in all of the streets, <laughs> it makes a QR code in the middle of it, so you can just scan it. It'll just take you to Google. <laughs> Why did I? This book looks really interesting. Why is there a map quest page <laughs> yeah. at the beginning? Ah, <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> well, there I just you want go. People to feel our... immersed, immersed in the world. <laughs> immersed, yeah. Um, <laughs> that makes me think of this, 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 there's this awesome, um, D and D rule, not D and D, but a tabletop rule set that, um, I believe, uh, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the company that put it out, but, um, it's, it's really cool. I played it with my friends uh, a few times and it is basically, you, it takes the real world and makes it a fantasy world. So yes. You use reference points and you use the, the room you're sitting in and all the stuff that you have on oh, you. And wow. It's super cool. Anyway, that's for another time. Let's get into our discussion of chapters 18 and 19 because we only have two chapters this week, but there's still a lot to discuss. Really cool stuff this week. Uh, so spoilers, starting now for chapters 18 and 19 of House of Chains. We start chapter 18, Lana. Mm. With a flashback. <laughs> it's uh it's old Shaikh thinking back to when she was Felis and Peran and uh and she was hanging out with her older brother and older sister, Tavor and Gnose. It's just when, when dinner time happened, it Felicin, Tavor, Gnose. Yeah. Just, I love it. Um <laughs> dinner time. Anyway, um, she was nine years old, Tavor, at the time, and she was already fantasizing about being a great general, about being a great war leader, and uh, she was trying to um, correct a famous battle from history uh, when the royal Unten army uh, was uh, was destroyed, I think. Uh, and um, basically, we get the sense that, you know, this is a lifelong pursuit is wanting to be uh, a great battlefield uh, commander. And she's got that deep down in her. She's, she has the skills. She's not just mm. fronting. Right. I loved this flashback for a couple of reasons. One, it takes me all the way back to the very first scene in the very first book with yeah. good news being a kid. And being like, I'm gonna be a soldier, and they're like, "Okay, kid, you're a noble. That's not you, that's not a profession that you should want to be." It's like, right. "Saki, don't do it. You're a noble." But it's like this is like in their family. So now we see Tavor fantasizing about these battles, and like Felicen talking about how when Ganus went off to do 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 soldiering, 
she sort of stepped into that mantle, but in like a more serious way. Uh, there's like a, a gravitas that she carries with her, a, a stoicism to which she faces the world and, and considers these problems. Um, and I just like that this is like, you know, big brother d- d- paving the path and younger sister seeing that and paving the way. And then almost, so I really just loved that mirror of her versus good news, both sort of looking at this military future, yeah. um, uh, but having two very different approaches. And I cannot help because of the circumstance of what she's going through being like, oh, she's trying to figure out that Kobayashi Maru baby. Yeah. She's, and, and like, uh, Total even though Korba- she's like Kobayashi the Miru. Yeah. stoic one, I'm like, now she's like in my brain. Her, uh, good news is like a Captain Kirk figure, and she's like a Spock situation. And <laughs> she does I just feel like the hmm. uh, one who shut off all her emotions and just does the <laughs> the thing that is most efficient. Logical, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I also love that it sets up this beautiful thing that plays out over these chapters of uh, everyone seeming to underestimate her, mm-hmm. right? Because we'll see, we'll talk about that later. But you know, we get to this point where Leo Man, um, is it Leo? No. Now, it can't be Liam, man. It's uh, the, they're underestimating her ability to be dangerous and to to you know that they think that she's just kind of this frivolous warrior who hired the wrong people and you know, commander. I mean, not warrior. Um, anyway, we'll get to that. Quick sidebar. Um, I know you're much, much, much younger than I, but when I was a kid, um, <laughs> there was nine a years sh- old. <laughs> yeah, there was a a show called Electric Company. <laughs> Okay. And it was like a, it was kind of like a Sesame Street style or Muppet show, kind of like, you know, there was uh, humans and mup- and puppets that talked to each other. And one of the segments was uh, uh, Gary Gnu, who was, who told you the Gnu's. And he, he was a newscaster. He was a Gnu, he was a, you know, a new, a, it was Gary Gnu because any Gnu's is good Gnu's. And I think of that every single time, literally. <laughs> Every single time we talk about Gano's parent. Anyway, <laughs> Gary Gano's. Uh, side, Gnu's sidebar to Gnu's. your sidebar. And I know this is not even the show, but do you know how many times that I've been looking for perhaps super glue and thought of you recently? <laughs> glue. I mean glue. <laughs> oh my God. It's forever burned in my brain. And I haven't even seen the real thing. Anyway, sorry. Sidebar to the sidebar. <laughs> That's a Old reference shows. for a completely yeah. different, different <laughs> no. show, everybody. All right. So um, then we get in, after the, the flashback, we're kind of uh, hanging out with uh, with Shaikh, with Felicin Peran and uh, and her uh, armies and uh, trying to figure out they're, you know, they're setting everything up. She's looking out over the battlefield, looking at the terrain and going, this is going to work or that's not going to work. Um, and does a very interesting thing, which is imagines that the whirlwind itself is going to be entered into the deck of dragons house of the whirlwind she's predicting Mm -hmm. uh pretty cool yeah pretty cool like after all this talk of like these these shattered warren pieces and one piece of it being like i've been a piece of my own long enough right like it's yeah the way that the magic works and the way that these warrens work is always like so interesting uh i that's like all i could really think of while that was happening was just like ah it's cool and for some reason like it makes sense it makes sense that it would be its own now yeah Uh, the the sort of fluid nature of all of it is so fascinating and over the course of all these novels the, the the fluid nature of the the pantheon of the gods where gods can enter and exit and you're never really secure and the and the deck of dragons itself is always sort of morphing and adapting and things are uh, ascending and descending in in relevance and importance and i think that's really cool and here we are in a book called you know house of chains mm-hmm. in a sub book called house of chains and she's like house of whirlwind house of whirlwind's going to be up in here up in here yeah. uh, i thought that was pretty pretty rad yeah and uh sorry before we we move on too far from the the sort of flashback section of like mm of Felicin sort of thinking through these pieces, but that flashback section, I also love that we get, I like that it's sort of foreshadowing for the, the future of the book and seeing more of Felicin. Um, but 
seeing the, the obsession with her sister start at such a young age and yeah. it's not like because she was cast out suddenly she's like that mad um it's that she's Tavor's always been distant and always been cold and right. Felicity is always like hungered after her in a particular way since right. they and were she, little kids she describes Tavor as kind of having the same relationship with Gnose right that mm-hmm. when he left she was kind of this she describes her as being this this shadow that's been Ugh. severed from its host, you know. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So in, a very interesting dynamic. And again, it's really cool how I, I I said this before many many episodes ago when we were talking about a completely different novel that you know Erickson could have established this series of books or at least these early few books of the series as being really viewed through the prism of this family of the the parent family and the three prongs of the three children and and how they bump into each other and all the different but he doesn't right we kind of we back our way into that relationship and that dynamic and i find that really fascinating because that feels like a a structure that was kind of just sitting there waiting to be exploited and he chose to zag instead of zigging which he always seems to do yeah um, but it's really cool mm-hmm. um speaking of how cold uh Tavor is we then have this really interesting metaphor established about cold iron versus hot iron and yeah. Laoric uh describes to uh Shaikh this notion of cold iron and hot iron what did you make of that well i we heard the metaphor earlier in the book, just a little bit, but I didn't sort of realize the importance. I like that. I like that it is a metaphor, but it is also like just a fact. Like, <laughs> uh, so yeah. going through this, it's like, these people are this way. These people are that way. That's just how it is. So we get it. And cold iron, it wins, baby. Um, right. I, I like that it started in a place of like, oh, this person was cold iron. I've got to become cold iron. And it, like it really started with like that me- metaphorical sense and like as you talk through it and as you learn more about it. Uh, but I think the my main takeaways is, is from it uh, are, you know, looking at these these powerful people. Through this section, I feel like I wasn't focused as much on the metaphor as like the names being thrown through and, and the people being yeah. described as ha- specifically being cold iron in the past. Um, yeah, so we have cold iron is Coltane, Dasim Ultor, Admiral Nock, Kaaz Devor, Leo Man, and then hot iron is uh, Corbel Odom, Mathok, and then there's these people that are described as being able to jump back and forth and be both. Get you get you a commander who's both. Mm. That's what I always have said. Uh, Dujek One Arm and Karsa Orlong, our buddy Karsa Orlong described. As being uh, both a, luke, hot a lukewarm and cold. iron, I think lukewarm iron. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the section, I mean, the, the thing that struck me about this section, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the the Decim Altor, a name that we haven't actually read in a couple books, um, mm. brought up a lot in these chapters to the point where I'm like, oh, that's the guy that we were trying to identify last week. Oh, interesting. You think that's, that's the that's third mis- guy. mystery, mystery third partner. It could be, but we've, so, you know, obviously this can be wrong, but we've been told that Dasim Ultar was killed. Obviously that could be a By swerve. Who? By who? I don't remember. I don't it know if we know. It says later Do that he was uh, supposedly killed by Empress Lacine. Oh, Right. And yes. she and we know that she did a lot of stuff, or people she, thought she did a lot of stuff she didn't do. She's done a lot of supposed killing. <laughs> That's right. Uh, namely of two other people who I think are related to. So you I think this is a solid theory that that that, that traveler is Dasim Ultor. And that no. maybe is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Traveler. Because the thir- traveler is the third. The third- Guy. The third buddy. Yeah. I forgot that it was Traveler, but yes. Yes. It also Traveler. makes sense if you think that the term Traveler was is the new is the new moniker because that person pieced out, 
right? They didn't weren't assassinated. They traveled <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, to get back to this hot iron, cold iron thing, I I I love this section. It felt it's a it's an odd moment in that everybody kind of talks like I I can't really explain it. Uh, here, here, let, you, you Mathok, come here. Uh, you, you explain it. Or, you mm-hmm. know, everybody's kind of like, I can't really put my finger on what makes someone hot iron or cold. But I, as the reader, felt very clear. I'm like, I, I get it. Cold iron is calculating, mm-hmm. precise, unaffected by emotion. You know, able to make the hard decisions. And just the idea of the, that, Coltane is cold iron. Is like, yeah. Dude, he was going through the chain of dogs step by step, being cold and calculating, shaving off large swaths of the chain of dogs, sacrificing those people to save the greater good, like Mm -hmm. doing, making those hard choices. I get that. And I get why that would be so effective and so intimidating to people that can't think like that. Mm -hmm. You know? And you go, yeah, that's the kind of commander that tends to win, is the one that isn't swayed by the passions of the moment, that is able to think clearly and be laser focused on the goal. Mm-hmm. And but hot iron. Hot, it's like, go, hot, sorry, go ahead. Hot iron. It's like hot head, like uh, not like rash decision, but like qu- like quick thinking, but not thorough thinking is sort of right. the uh, like uh, vibe that I got or short term gains that can be long-term games if they're successful enough but right. like in the long term like which one's going to come out on top nine times out of ten the one that's thought through all the problems and the one that is going to sort of be persistent and be sort of trudging forward yeah and this this the hardness to them will carry them through whereas hot iron is maybe a little bit more malleable and could collapse under pressure yeah it's like it's like rationality versus um emotion Passion, you know fire. it, it, it yeah, and and you you get the sense that the hot iron leaders are the ones get, that can whip their followers into a frenzy, get them to do things. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you have to you have to be uh, have a rational assessment of your leader to even recognize that Coltane is doing the right thing in those moments. It's like, what is this madman doing? You know, but and I think trust. You have to yes. have like trust. Whereas yeah. I think with with hot iron, it's very like, do this, do it, or right. die. Yeah. Exactly. A really cool dynamic established there. Uh, and and the, the realization at the end, uh, well, the two realizations, one is like, yeah, but we killed Coltane. He didn't always win. It's like, no, we fought Coltane nine times. Mm-hmm. He beat us eight out of nine. <laughs> you know? I like, love that. I love So that. rad. Yes. It's such a good example in like the most explicit possible way. It's like, this, does this feel like a victory? And you happen to win, you happen to win one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you had to get all this help to be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Such a rad moment. And then that, then the final revelation that F- Fellison has, which is, oh, Tavor is cold iron mm. and cold iron wins. And yeah. I don't have anybody left in my ranks that's cold iron that can stand up to that. Pretty cool. But so here's the thing, because I know we cut to Leoman in a second. She's like, yeah, you know, T- uh, Toblakai has gone over away and yeah. Leoman is somewhere in the south, but he does seem to be still fighting for her because like the big raid that happens against the Malazans is Leoman. Yeah, he's fighting for her, but in also opposition to her wishes. He's oh, like, yes. I'm going to do it my way. You, you don't mess around with doing that. I'm going to raid these guys. I'm going to murder them. I'm going right, to, right, right, I know right. the right way to do this. And so, yeah, he's, he's fighting for the cause, but he's kind of, but for know, him, himself off on his own. His own. Yeah, he's, yeah. Yeah. He's a little a wall, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. So the next scene, it, we, we meet a, what I believe to be a new character. You can correct me if I'm wrong. We may have met this character before, but I didn't remember. Korab. <laughs> No, I don't think that we have because like the uniqueness of the circumstances that <laughs> he gets to do over the next couple of chapters. Very funny character. Oh, I love him. Love him. <laughs> and he like the idea that he's that Leo man like found him being dragged by horses. And he's uh, like, oh, thanks for getting those horses off me. Uh, uh, 
what do you want me to do? He's like, I'm gonna, you're going to be my assistant. He's like, yes, anything for you, buddy. <laughs> uh, as long as I have all the skin on my back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, anything you want, man. <laughs> Those horses were dragging me a long way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're kind of like starting their – their plan to uh, trick the uh, the the Wiccans, the Seti, the Kundrils into uh, chasing them, but we don't kind of don't know that yet. All we know is that they're going to disobey Felicin uh, slash Shaikh <laughs> and uh, do their own thing. Um, then we get uh, Laoric heading to uh, Karsa Orlong's uh, workshop, his little his, his uh, little happy place, his Glade. Yeah. He's Glade. Uh, plug it in, plug it in. Anyway, um, terrible. Uh, but uh, Felicity the Younger is still there, still hiding out there. Uh, Laoric realizes that this place is sanctified in some way. It's special. For whatever uh, Karsa did in kind of, um, you know, uh, making the gods manifest, making his, his Talana Moss uh unbound manifest means that the whirlwind goddess kind of can't peek in on what's going on here. So I thought that was cool. a little spot. pocket of secrecy. Yeah. I, 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 there's a, even just like, it's just these two chapters. There's two things, like a couple moments where something is sort of teed up nicely. And then we, like a mirror of it later, yeah. that just felt really satisfying to me. And this is one of them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Felicity and the Younger is like, Hey, did my mom ask, ask how I'm doing? Oh. So it's, She's oh, so busy. It's, I mean, I don't <laughs> remember her saying anything. But... We, we talked about so many things. <laughs> um, I'm sure she's thinking about you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, <sighs> And just like the sort of heartbreaking, the, the grim acceptance, and she's like, "I, I, I knew it." So she doesn't. She like she's lo- she's like she's lost to this cause, but you know, she sees, she knows, she knows the reasons that this guy's gonna stay around. She's like so, yeah, it like she's so honest in the way that this is like oh, what you've been. You're so tragic and so crappy, and then ask the question: Is 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 the, like the one person who saw me, who cares about me, thinking about me? She's not. Well, it's even worse <sighs> it's than fine. that because she's like, is it because she doesn't think of me, or because she already knows the answer? Yeah. Which is worse? Oof! Brutal. Brutal. Yeah. Um. So and then uh, it, it, she has this wonderful um, insight into the fact that everyone that is in Seven Cities, all the people that are uh, caught up in the, the rebellion are orphans. They're all orphans. Um, and that really the goddess, the whirlwind goddess, is this sort of force that, that injects indifference into the mix. That is a, it, mm. it is a, it is a power of not caring. Uh, and she says, you know, that's kind of, I, I, I took it. My takeaway was that it was kind of this realization that the goddess isn't necessarily a good thing. It's yes. kind of negative. Yeah. Well, I also like that this conversation is happening in this little bubble. And like, yeah. I feel like, you know, even when, you know, the like Bithal, like in the scenes after Bithal attacked, listen the younger um there was like the way that she's like no no everything's i it has to be this way it was right. almost like more uh like i i i deserve this for for the whirlwind right. and this conversation with her now i feel this edge of bitterness and i feel like being in this pocket has the absence of that whirlwind, the absence right. of that apathy, that uncaringness. She is feeling something. And even though logically she's like, she needs this, it's it's not from that place of sort of resilient sacrifice like uh or like right. honorable sacrifice. It's yes. from a place of of uh, that it's becoming more and more sour, which the just the change in flavor between talking with Fliss and the younger, the previously and now it's so distinct and i yeah i just like that i like it 
I agree. Yeah. And she talks about the indifference as a poison mm -hmm. uh, and says, you know, hey, nothing new. Ask any orphan. We get it. And then she says, we're all orphans. Everybody here is an orphan. Pretty interesting stuff. She literally lists why everybody is an orphan. Mm -hmm. um, and I also like that she's like, oh, you think I don't know that that's not Shaik for real? She's like, I yeah. knew the second that Felicin looked at me because she right. Shaik never did. Um, yeah, it's yeah. good. And then we get even more sort of confirmation of this, this indifference being a poison injected by the whirlwind goddess when Felicin the Older, Shaik, uh, walks over to Haborek's tent. Haborek's inside like, I'm, I'm busy in here. Don't, don't come in. <laughs> <laughs> Not, nothing to see here. It's just like all crazy <laughs> sorceries on the outside. She's like, no, no, no. I want in. You know who's here. It's me, Shaik. Hmm. Primo mama of the whole place. Get out, get out. And he's like, all right, fine. Come in. And he pulls her in. And the the sorcery, the, the, the wards that he has uh, on the outside of his tent that are sort of sanctifying this place for Treach rips the goddess out. She's not welcome in there. And it's this amazing moment. This is one of my favorite. Well, sorry, you, you're excited too. No, I just, this, this is one of my favorite uh, things. The way that she transforms and immediately gets empathy, immediately starts th having all these realizations of like, oh my gosh, Beneth and the Mines was awful. He was awful to me. Oh my gosh, Bowden, Culp. Oh my gosh, I cared for them. Bad things happened to them. Oh my gosh. Felicity the Younger, what's going on? With and Hebrick's like, ah, back out, back out, back out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, now, what is your, so go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I want to know what you're going to ask. I want to ask what is your interpretation as to why Haborik is like, you can't think this. He pushes her out of the tent so that the goddess gets back in her so she doesn't think this way. She doesn't think about Felicity the Younger. Oh, that's, yeah. I act, Well, my take was not that he's like, oh, I don't want you to think about this. My take with that was that he's like, oh my gosh, that is dark. I think there's mm, like a, a it's chance. It's too, too heavy for you. It, well, I, I thought that it was like, it's it's dark. Uh, uh, and you're probably right. There's like an urgency. It's like something has to be done about this. He pushes her out because he's like, oh my God, get out, get out, get out. Not because he cared about her, but because he cared about Phyllis and the Younger because he immediately leaves to go check on her. And he wants to well, confirm he, yeah, that that's He immediately true. leaves to go kill uh, Bidithal, right? Yes. And so to me, it was not it was not a care of Phyllis and Shaik. It was a care for this vow that he made and like the urgency to which he needed to follow up on that. Interesting. My see what I that's I think that's really good read of it. I my take was that he was he was like, you can't your burdens are too great already in what you have to do for the greater mm. cause you can't be thinking, thinking about, about this stuff like you have to you have to be cold iron in a sense you have to be above the sort of emotional fray of worrying about all these things that are now flooding into your consciousness go get the whirlwind goddess and, and almost like endorsing the indifference that the goddess puts in someone because it allows you to make cold and calculated decisions. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I, I, I like that read on it because it like speaks to a care that I do think Hebrick still has for her. Yeah. Um, the thing and man, it, it killed me how quickly that scene was over. It killed I me know. how quickly it was over. How I quickly was like, he pushes her out. You're like, no, no, no. She but just, look, what? Sh sh yeah. She's feeling stuff that she needs to feel and she's like a good person. And, and uh, she's saying these things that I feel like I've been waiting three bucks yeah. for her to feel. Like, come <laughs> on. Uh, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So funny. Um, all right. Then we have this really odd moment where we actually get a POV from Bidithal, who's like just twirling his mustache, <laughs> just sitting there going, I'm evil. And... Uh, <laughs> Pretty awesome. He's thinking about the the, the Warrens uh, and how they're in in war with each other. Um, he's he's plotting against Shadow Throne and Cotillion and just being just ruminating on how his plans need to come together. And he calls this <laughs> army of shadows. Very strange stuff. So uh, th there's something that uh, 
we've said in, in previous episodes and we've talked through it. And uh, I know that uh, the folks commenting often have been like, please don't forget that there's shadow and darkness. Right. As two different concepts. Yes. And so I think it's interesting because I thought so much about that. These chapters in particular with bit of all being like this old shadow priest and like trying to get his revenge on the, you know, the, the, the usurpers of the throne. Right. Um, but then there's these kids who have been, uh, who are all part of his army who are, I assume are the same people, but they're saying, do you remember the dark? And Mm. so with that like distinction in mind, do the, the people, are they the same? Are they working with him? Is he, is it darkness or shadow? Does that matter? Interesting. I'm not clear. Yeah. I think that's all a little mysterious at this point. Okay. At least for me it is. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but they like, yeah, sorry. He's doing his, his evil stuff. He's got his evil army and he he has his revenge too. Yeah. Um, then we ha- hop over to the other evil plotters, uh, <laughs> Corbolo Dom and Chemist Relo. And, uh, th- you know, Corbolo Dom is just like, I'm so smart. I'm so rad. And he's got this drugged lady uh, who passed out on his lap. And he's just like, oh, dude, we're going to, this is going to be so rad when we were awesome. And Chemist's like, hey, maybe, uh, maybe we're not the only clever people. Maybe there's other people who are clever. And he's like, impossible. That's ridiculous. Patently false. Oh my uh, gosh. I even just like hearing their names has gotten to the point where I'm like, I can't like help but eye roll because they're yeah. like, they're so. <laughs> They're full, definitely full the are porn so... quals of this book. Oh, this book. big porn qual energy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But like such, again, like my distaste for them and my the way that I feel that I hate them is like so expertly driven from like mm. sitting there and you're like, oh, he's got like a friend on his lap. That's like a tender moment. No, he's drugged her. He picked her up by her hair and just dropped her head on the ground. It's like... Duh. it's just yeah. the worst the worst and also his his whole thing about like i got the 11 most deadly assassins yeah. four of them <laughs> have been magically made younger three of them selected from the finest of the people <laughs> and two of them and, it, and one of them will kill themselves for me yeah so yes. it's, it's it, it is it's it is dry wine i like a dry wine <laughs> I picked the one that hit the arrow that killed Sormo Inath, and it was that one. There was lots of arrows that killed him, but this was the one that got him in the neck. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it's it so good. Uh, and yeah. Chemist is like, um, buddy, what if she like, what if uh, she like lets a claw loose in our midst and we don't even know it? And he's like, ah, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> The co- um, like the confidence. I mean, I, for, to me, the this hubris. is the yeah. epitome of the hot iron, right? Mm, it's the yes, right. Confidence to the point of blindness. It is right. the infused with yourself. There's an egotism about it. It's yes. It's yeah. Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe nobody thought of these things, but it's it's blinders. It's tunnel vision. It's yeah. single minded. And then we get this cool moment where the drugged lady is like, ah, I was all, I was faking. I was faking the whole not, time. Not that. Well, she, yeah, she was faking I have the whole been time. Slowly over time, developing a, an immunity to Iocane powder. <laughs> Inconceivable. <laughs> um, <laughs> Silara, Silara is her name, and she is cl- a, a spy. That was sent there to listen in. And uh, she goes back to uh, the Dog Slayer camp and uh, finds this um, this uh, informant and says, I have I have something to tell Bidithal. So she's uh, – we don't really see what becomes of that, but I love that moment. I love – you know, we, we have from Corbel Adam's perspective, the drug girl, like you said, dropping the head, and then her like – yeah, I uh, 
I've been listening to everything. I know exactly. She coughs to make sure he's asleep, drugs his drink. So well, cool. she waits to cough until he's asleep because he doesn't want – he wants her to seem that she's like so out of it and so drugged yeah. up that she's – but so she has to wait. She has to hold like a coughing reaction, which like, even just thinking about holding in one cough is terrible. Yeah. It's yeah. that feeling is bad for how many how long until he passes out. It's like mastermind, but she is actually been given tons of drugs, but it's just like built up a tolerance for it. And then just that juxtaposition of like the confidence of like, I've got beds in every room. What does that say? It's like, well, yeah, yeah. you're a piece of crap. He's like, but only this one's for sleeping. And now it's nap nap time. Like <laughs> confidence of this guy to yeah. her stumbling out, stumbling uh, past the guards who, who grope her as they catch her stumbling yeah. through the camp to the de- like like literally the toilets where yeah. the like basically the forgotten people that uh, I think in like the previous scene Shaikh never would have seen before are yeah. literally wading through the crap to find random garbage that they might be able to wash and and resell so it's cool. like yeah such a great juxtaposition of these these worlds that are living on top of one another yes um and then those are the people who are part of this like and the, the call is just i i remember the dark mm-hmm. and then calling so out me, me too sis is uh yeah it's so great. good you're right so so well said i love all those little details and it's so evocative that that journey she goes on, you know, looking for handholds, just trying to like she's got an. It's she's not immune to the drugs. She's she's got a tolerance, but she's mm-hmm. still messed up. And yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. So then we get uh, Heboric uh, heading over to Carsa Orlong's uh, glade, and he's like, "I am. I'm going to check in on Phyllis and the younger. Oh, there she still is. No, nah, I'm not going to say anything to her. Ooh, I'm going to go kill Bitterthal. I'm going to go kill him right now. Right now, maybe not." Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> Maybe it's not a good idea. Ah, oh, my new god wouldn't like it. I'm a destriant now. He's like, he's, wouldn't my new god like? Isn't he like a killer? Why won't you just? What could I learn about that? Could I get some oh, higher energy? Still, if I still had those Jade and Otatural hands, I would so do it right now. Ooh. <laughs> 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 and, then, and then he walks by uh, that girl who's like killing lizards and hanging them on her belt. And he's like, she doesn't see me. I am, I am the God of stealth. I am a, the Supreme. I am a, I am, I am a whisper in the wind. And the it's girl's like, like Who, who's that idiot? It's like, <laughs> ironically, it feels kind of like an Iskarol pus thing where he's like, I got this. She can't see anything. Yeah. And then she definitely sees him. What a weird, what a weird dude. And then the irony being Israel Puss is actually very good at hiding. And that's like his whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I like that. But also it gave me like the of her like little girl, like la 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 la. Kill lizard, break its neck on the back. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's totally like one, yeah, little... two, Freddy's he... coming for you. That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so then we uh, we we go back to uh, Korab and Leo Man, and they're uh, just uh, taking out uh, parts of the Malazan army, um, and they have these cool bolos with like fire on them. It's so rad. Yeah. Uh, and and Korab's like, I don't like sharp things <laughs> near me. <laughs> Very funny. Very uh, funny stuff. I'm a warrior, but I don't like. Blades. I, like, and- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this scene because I felt like it happened so quickly. And then you don't, we don't sort of understand like exactly how much devastation that they caused in such a short period of time. Cause it really does feel like they're like, yeah, yeah get out. Like a quick yeah. stab and then pieced out. Um, and then later we find out it was like, Oh, they executed like 300 people. That's but the, a lot. The coolest part. <laughs> Is is that he's like on his horse, they they shoot all these crossbow bolts at him. He's like, ah, ah and he <laughs> falls, he rolls, his horse falls, it rolls, it rolls back to his feet, he hops back on and rides off. I was like, 
that is the raddest thing ever. And then it, cu- it literally cuts to the the soldiers like, did you just see that? It's so It's the best. It's the so best. Good. I love it because it's like, well, <laughs> so first of all, he only notices that they're going to shoot all the bolts at him because one of them shoots early and cuts right. across his cheek. So he gets like a little lucky right hint about that but i like that he literally screams as he falls over like he's like so comedic and yeah. then the cutaway to them being like what the hell is so good uh <laughs> they're like did you get him oh yeah we got oh nope he's up he's Wait, he's off he's, up. he's fine he's up. the horse the horse is up they're both <laughs> you know what they deserve that <laughs> <laughs> it's good for and, them. And the best is that he's not doing that because he's a badass. It was like he just like fell and rolled and the horse fell and rolled. He's like, oh, I got back on the horse. He's just like completely. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bumbling. And it's like, great. There is a way that so, that, that could have been written for like another character. And it would have been like, he like leapt sleekly and his horse had been so trained for this moment. But oh, like, yeah. no, they're just clumsy and they made it out okay. It's well, so, it, such a hilarious character trait i can't remember the name of the character right now my brain is not working but the the guy from um memories of ice that goes and and sac- knows that he, he and all his army is going to get killed uh and he's on the they're on the back of the horse like there's there's a similar kind of moment but it is in the f- from the badass perspective of like mm-hmm. oh this is amazing he's fighting by the back of the horse in the front of the horse and meanwhile corab is like whoa oh geez oh okay i'm back on <laughs> it's just so funny <laughs> so good yeah uh, all right, and, send, uh, and then meanwhile, Leo Man is, they're like, you know, they're going to trick the 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 SETI and the Wiccans into chasing them. Um, and we cut cut to this scene with, with Febril, who we've been told over and over and over is going to be um, betraying the goddess. And that's the whole reason Bidithal has, has been allowed to continue is because Bidithal is going to suss out the plans and save Shaikh from this betrayal. Mm-hmm. And Febril is just standing, watching the sunrise, just loving it. So nice. And Felicin comes over or Shaikh comes over and is like, that's not the direction of the sunrise. <laughs> Wrong direction. It's over there, buddy. Uh, this is it's tricky because the whirlwind, you know, reflects light weird. But you've been looking the wrong direction the whole time. And he's like, shook, shook to the point where he's just like, I'm not doing anything I was planning. Which, mm-hmm. Tell me what your thoughts on this scene are. My thoughts on the scene are that Felicin or Shaikh, you know, has has more per sleeve than we know and especially Mm. through the the course of the the last sort of chapter and and a bit you know there's reason that she has confidence and part of that is the infusion of being i guess possessed by the whirlwind goddess Uh, and the other part of that is like she really has real things like strategies up her sleeve that give her confidence right one of them is the whirlwind being a war in itself um one of them is the I guess the power of the border of the whirlwind, you know, we saw earlier with Kalam being like thrown through it by a demon that it's like pot, like she can sense when anything pierces through, but also this idea, you know, that we're learning that there's this power that if you try and go through at certain times of day, it has soaked in all the heat from the sun and is like a ring of fire that will like just burn you to a crisp. If you try and walk through is like, Oh, that I guess is a bit of an advantage. (laughs) um and it will uh, also sense you and and tell her it's also you know a a perimeter alarm proximity alarm yeah yeah um and you know there's all these this talk of like it seems weird that she would want us to come all the way to her and just like keep walking through this path and it's like yeah if at the end is the wall of fire that you all just walk through like there's like certain pieces that make more sense about like these like this two like the two different perspectives that we get of the army. Um, But those are sort of broader thoughts. And then when it comes down to um, what's his name? Febril. Febril. Um, 
he seems like a like almost like he could be just like a little free agent. It seems yeah. like he does have like nefarious plans, but then he's like, "Oh, those plans seem bad. I don't even know where the sun is." Well, that, like, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a it's an odd scene because I felt like Felicity the younger has gone through hell mm-hmm. to ensure that Bidithal isn't ousted from the camp or worse, mur- I mean, just completely killed from mm-hmm. f- for all of the horrors that he's committed. You know, we got to keep Bidithal around because of Febril, because of Febril, because of Febril. And then this, this scene comes, it's like, oh, it kind of felt like it stole a little of the power of that. <laughs> it kind of felt like you could be like, oh, you could probably just change Febril's mind. Yeah. <laughs> Like, just don't make him betray you. But maybe, I mean, clearly Corbolo Dom and Chemist Rallo are also planning. So maybe, you know, Bidithal is still in. And the fact that we saw Bidithal's spy get information on Corbolo Dom means that maybe he's still useful. But it just, it seemed odd to me that Febril, and maybe that's just my misreading of it, that Febril was the big problem. But I thought Febril was the big problem and to have that diffused so effortlessly. I thought Febril was the weak link was sort of my perspective mm. on it. My my understanding was that like Febril was a part of like both plans. The really, mm. uh, you know, Shaikh's plans of the fact that she has her priests and they're supposed to be helping the whirlwind on this path. But then also Corbel Adam and Camus Relo's plans and Febril was a part of it. But didn't little did he know that they were also going to betray him. <laughs> right. Kind of. Hmm. vibe and so because febril was sort of like this between state he was going to be the uh camus and uh Cor- corbel and dom were going to be like yeah febril you're part of our plan that means you have to do this thing and it's like the overt betrayal would happen from febril mm. so meanwhile corbel and camus could like do their secondary betrayal in the end that makes more sense so it's, it's sort of being dismantled piece by piece rather than completely rug pulling the entire plan Yes, that's that's yeah. my understanding. I think that makes more sense. That's probably accurate. Um, all right, so scene, excuse me, so uh, chapter 19 begins, and maybe we shouldn't, but it, but we often just don't even talk about the uh, epigraphs at the beginning. Mm-hmm. This is one epigraph where I was like, because <laughs> it's about grub, yeah, and the fact that little grub was purportedly just walked the entire way, even though there's like he was five, probably didn't happen, probably a little apocryphal. But then at the end, it's like, anyway, that's uh, part of the story about the guy who eventually became high fist of the empire, and it's like little grub. Yeah, little grub, little grub. I like it. it's like uh, possibly unfortunately named grub, and I'm like, yeah, his name's grub. Uh, I still, I don't know if it's grub. I still, you know, I know I, I told myself I wasn't going to do this this week, but I'm still like looking for those, you know, glimmers of like, we know that Coltane has been reborn in some body. <laughs> I forget yeah. if it was like my suspicion is, is grub Coltane. And that's why it becomes high fist of the empire because it's Coltane in this guy, but, or is he somewhere else? I forget what they said when they said it. Well, I could be completely wrong about this, but I I suspect that this little tidbit of info about Grub is outside the purview of the novels. Like it never, we, oh. it, it felt to me like one of those cool little info drops that's just like, and the story continues after, you know, like, and by the way, this guy grows up to be something, we're not going to talk about it ever again. It's not even in our time period you know i i suspect that the novel 10 will end far before grub ever becomes the high fist <laughs> but, but i love i love when books do this when it's just like oh and yeah by the way far in the future this will happen you don't need to worry about it but it's just a little texture you know it's, it's interesting to me because grub is so young and on the chance that Grub does remain through the course of the novels, the fact that this is here, and and especially the fact that we're talking about it, it sort of removes the sense of danger of Grub, uh, any scene Grub's in. <laughs> that too, yeah. Um, that too. 
So it'll be interesting to see how things continue and whether or not we get like some kind of time skip or whether or not Grub gets like artificially grown up or yeah, I just secretly an adult. He's not even really a child. Like uh, I could be completely wrong, but my my instinct on my intuition is that it's just one of those cool little like BT dubs. He grows up. We're not going to talk about it anymore. I hope that it is. I hope that it is. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's the little epigraph that starts chapter 19. Chapter 19 is basically uh, a big battle. Um, we, we start with uh, Tavor and Gamut looking over the uh, the SETI that got duped into chasing Leo men and slaughtered. And they're like, oh, they killed 300 of these idiots that just ran off because they thought they were going to get easy pickings. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see that, that Leo men's uh, little trap worked. Uh, and T- Tavor is like, I'm going to use the strategy that Decimaltor used in the year 1147. Yeah. And just more evidence that she's like really well studied and knows her stuff. What a military nerd. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just called to mind battles. But then, of course, she's like, the, the, the thing that Decimaltor, and people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know the one. Okay. We're on it. Everybody yeah. knew. Yeah. They're all, oh, they're yeah, yeah. All the Dasimulta thing. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> no, good no, one. good. Good thinking. That's yeah. in my top five. That's in my top five, bro. <laughs> it's what I would have done if I was also, you know, <laughs> adjunct. Um <laughs> then we get this wonderful detour. Just I love that these novels are so are are so willing to just have a little fun sidebar for many mm. many pages <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do a scorpion fight now now we're gonna we're gonna hang out with the with the hang out with the uh the, the soldiers and they're gonna do a scorpion fight and yes <laughs> does it add up to something interesting and cool it does but it do- totally feels like this and now for something completely different <laughs> to, to me and maybe this is because you know i'm a dweeb as well i'm like this is like great leadership on display it's not all business all the time. You have yeah. to have camaraderie. You have to have bonding. And it can't just be forged in the you know, regular despair or tragedy or right. like, you know, vicious totally battle you a, see every day. <laughs> he does a team bonding exercise. Yeah. There's trust falls, there's scorpion fighting, you know, it's all the stuff. It's also training for the word line or whatever. It's all yeah. together. It is. At the end of it, he's like what did we learn? Hey guys. <laughs> hey, we all had fun today, but you know what? There's even something more important. We learned how to word line everybody. Yeah. <laughs> right. Didn't we? <laughs> and you can, as, as much as you can use it for a scorpion fight, you can use it to really commands during the battle and never forget <laughs> that. You're welcome. Don't forget that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they do that thing where we have to decide who crosses the river on the raft and it can only fit a couple people, yeah. you know, it's trust. Yeah. It's trust. <laughs> Team building. <laughs> But also, I, we're gonna I, do improv games. <laughs> uh, have you heard of Zip Zap Zop? Okay. <laughs> um, I also love the scene because you know the the bridge burners are are no more. But you know, Fiddler drawing from what he knows, and also drawing from what he likes. You know, we we saw the the, the cards and them trying to do. I think they specifically said, we want to try and do what Fiddler does and pull one over on everybody so we yeah. make a ton of money. But we yeah. saw them fail. Right. And so now we get to see Fiddler actually pull one over on everybody like do we what didn't do. get to see before. And because we saw people fail before, I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to backfire. And it's like, no, Fiddler's just great. And now he's rich. It's like now such a rich. fun. Like, Very funny. It's the, great. It's great. It's great. <laughs> yeah. The, the the idea of like, okay, everybody, you can pick pick your scorpions. Oh, I'm going to pick that big, cool one. Oh, I'm going to pick that translucent, poisony one. Okay, well, I'm going to take the bird shit one. The tiniest little one. <laughs> I like that. Didn't they Don't do worry it from about like, me. by like drawing rocks? And he's like, oh, I guess I'm stuck with the last one. Oh, hum. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I just love how smug he is at every moment where everybody's like, oh, oh. And he's just like. <laughs> so funny uh joyful union is the name of his scorpion uh which we find out can split in two and uh take him out very and I, funny and i just like how that whole day you know 
it is a sidebar, but it's not like they're like, and hey, we're going to do a scorpion fight. And here's the fight. He's like, okay, we need somebody carrying them. We got to make rules. Somebody's got to carry the bugs. Somebody's got to uh, feed the bugs. There's a so, trainer. There's a trainer. <laughs> somebody's got a train. It's like, he's making this whole mini game up. It's yeah. Uh, uh, it's just, so I charming. also love that they make the, the little scorpion battle arena out of knives <laughs> pointing inwards. Yeah, it's so cool. And the way it's described where the, the scorpions are like coming up to this blade edge and like, wow, no, I don't want to go there. Uh, it's yeah. just <laughs> rad. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and he's like, so you see how uh, my awesome scorpion uh, split in two and, and murdered everybody? That's what we're going to do right now. Everybody, let's fight. And then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. And uh, sorry, the last thing. I There's so many charming little things throughout the whole thing from like the conversation of being like, this scorpion, I've seen it. It doesn't like, I've tried to trade it. It doesn't do anything. I feed it something and then he eats it and then it just sits there licking its lips and they're like, it's lips? It's like <laughs> such a real yeah. feeling conversation of like among friends, this, this stupid stuff that you can call each other on and yeah. completely... I feel like I've had a moment in my life that is the equivalent of you want to tell me this story, but the rest of us are stuck on the fact that you said that bug had lips. And what does that mean <laughs> of how you got to that conclusion? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, delicious. I just delicious. Yeah. <clears throat> so then we get uh, sort of some prep scenes. Uh, Fiddler and Cuddle are, are making their their bomb crossbows, which is pretty rad. Uh, and um Tavor and Gamut are trying to get the warlocks to like talk to the spirits and like we don't talk we can't get them anymore it's not I mean maybe we asked we don't get to tell anymore we can ask mm -hmm. we don't get to command we just get to request um and I love this characterization of Gamut as getting into this state of being um like the blood rushing to his head and him being unable to hear people talk and just I, I so rare in these kinds of novels to get that level of um it, it, it's real but it's also vulnerable. You know there's yeah. a vulnerability to it that that I can relate to that I understand that that feeling of like high pressure resulting in this physical manifestation. I, I just I loved it. it. It was really powerful and you kind of feel for Gamut who's this older guy and you know, later on when he gets hurt and he's just like, oh, everybody's too young. I shouldn't have done this. This is this is a horrible thing. Why are we even doing this? I just, I, it really made me like him in a way I had not before. Mm -hmm. And like just the, it's like the self-deprecation, but like the self-awareness of like, man, I was a guard for like a noble house. That is where I should stop being like the high fist. Right. Like this is not. I'm not qualified for this. I'm not qualified for this. Yeah. It's yeah. uh, it's great. So good. Um. And then, and we get Korab and Leo Man's uh, hubris as well. They're like underestimate underestimation of, um, you know, the the possible retaliation from the Malazans, um, and how Empress Lacine, you know, she's nobody. She all her uh, all her, her commanders aren't around. Like this is going to be easy. Um, we're gonna we're gonna totally dupe these guys we're gonna it's gonna be a route no problem uh and then we get <clears throat> one of the coolest battle representations thus far in the in the series in my opinion because it is just ping-ponging back and forth between each side of the battle mm -hmm. and we've talked so much about how erickson does something that I just have not really seen before, which is not giving you a side to root for. And here is that writ large in that I like both of these sides. I like the people that I'm in the POV of at all times and they're fighting each other and I'm not really hoping one triumphs. I'm just invested in each of the sides as they go back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's I, wild. I feel... Like in the end, it's almost like the same way I, I felt. <laughs> this is going to be a very lame reference. But when I felt like when I was watching probably any game, but specifically esports, where like I don't ever want to see one team just sweep it all. Series mm, is over. Yeah. Boring. 
I always said I wanted the team that I wanted to win to win in the seventh game, the last possible game I won exciting. And I feel that same feeling through this battle where, you know, the uh, Leoman, they're like, they're so loud, these idiots. We can see them. I can see their helmets. And I'm like, boo, boring. I don't want it to be. (laughs) And then we came and wiped them out. I want to see these strategies. I want to like the excitement of that ping ponging like that. I feel like that's the part, like the space I'm living in because you're right. I want, I'm like, Oh, we, we switched to Fiddler's side. I'm like, get him. We switched to Lehman's side. It's like, get him. Like that's, it's the excitement in it is watching the strategies play out versus (laughs) trying not to get like attached to characters that are going to kill each other. It feels like a tricky line to walk, though, um, just, you know, narratively, because yeah. you're asking the reader, you're putting this re- reader in a place of, you know, not having a clear uh, place to, to to put their uh, Hopes allegiances. Hopes and dreams. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, but it's but it's still so fun. It's so fun to see both sides struggling and working with limited information, and one side knowing something, the other side not knowing another thing. And it, it's uh, it's really cool. It's really cool, and I just love you know in Liam's mind going through and being like Ugh, these dum dums. They are t- yeah. so awful. And then when like Fiddler and their crew were like, surprise, <laughs> we did yeah. get here early and we got gotcha. you. He's yeah. kind of like, well. We underestimated that one. It's like yeah. So- well, I think that's what's the, the the whole purpose of this extended sequence seems to me that Leo Man comes out of it going, the Malazans are are not to be underestimated. The Malazans <laughs> are like, and it's more specifically adjunct Tavor and the Empress. Mm-hmm. Right, are not to be underestimated because we thought that all their best leaders are, uh, you know, have abandoned them or not abandoned them, but are not are not present. We thought they were going to be easy pickings, and guess what? They're smarter than we thought. Mm-hmm. And I I thought that was a pretty cool way to get that information delivered. You know? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the details of of the battle are pretty fun the, the the way each side thinks they're setting a trap the molasses trap seems to work a bit better fiddler and uh and uh cuddle are shooting off bombs and blowing things up and then that just amazing moment <laughs> with korab <laughs> where he's like something lands in his lap and then we cut over to cuddle like coming back to uh fiddler and be like oh dude i did the i did the funniest thing i just dropped a grenade in this dude's lap what okay watch 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 all right right three two one and they he just <laughs> throws the helmet on top of it and i have this am- amazing image in my head of him just riding this yeah. thing high like a geyser yeah. like a cartoon character on a geyser like <laughs> <laughs> just I, amazing I, I always love there's like it been several times that we've been uh, in like a chapter and like the POV of the moment. In this case, we see it twice. You know, we see the guy's thought process of like, you know, the bomb rolls between his legs and he gives a whimper, but then he grabs the helmet. Like he's like thinking about it. But then we see yeah. it, seeing it from the other POV where you're like, <laughs> look at this idiot. And they're like, look, oh, he's going to dash, dash away. He's not going to make it out of there. Oh, he grabbed a helmet. That's not going to do anything. And then he's fine. And in my brain, I just hear like, beep, 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 beep. And he's like, yeah. scampers away. And they're like, what the heck's wrong with this guy? <laughs> it's exactly the same thing that happened with the horse. We're just like, we definitely murdered that guy. What? He's fine? He's leaving. He's leaving. He's fine. Hmm. You know what? He well, earned that's, it. That's, that's on us, I guess. That's, yeah. uh, I'll take the L. I'm going to take yeah. the L on Fiddler that being like, you got clever. That was dumb. <laughs> Next yeah. time, just too, kill him. Too cute. But, I think he says too cute, right? Yeah, too cute. You got you got too cute <laughs> with so it. So good. Uh, I am tickled by by all of that. It's I just... want to see that happen fifty more times. It's like <laughs> I want the highlight reel of just I want Korab his... to just be <laughs> yeah, just be getting out of scrapes in the Korab most ridiculous. Korab the unkillable. <laughs> yes. Oh, so good. Um. And then we have, uh, you know, Gamut injured. Gessler comes over and uh, says, like, get the healer over here. And he has this just beautiful moment of, no, don't worry about me. You know, I, I'm 
you, if you help me, lives will be lost. I, I'm don't worry about me. Save other people. I should never have brought. Everybody's too young. I just his sensitivity and empathy in that moment is lovely. Mm -hmm. And then we cut forward to him talking to Tavor and uh, saying like, "I understand you're going to demote me." And she's like, "What? No, what?" <laughs> He's like, no, I get it. I'm terrible at this. I should never have been. And she's like, okay, well, Captain Keneb will be the new fist. He's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I don't want to do it. The implication I got that she's like, Captain Keneb will definitely be the new fist until you're healed. Yeah. It was right. like the But vibe. I think I got it as that's the way we do this. That's the process is mm -hmm. we say it this way. But he'll never be fist again. Is my was my read of it. Mm. Um, is like this is the way we do it. We like oh temporarily he will be high fist, and then we just sort of, you know, as that happens, you're not a coward. You're not, you know, you're not relinquishing your mm. role. This is a necessity. We have to do it. And then as time passes, you'll just fade away and not. Oh, interesting. Yeah, seamlessly like transfer power without it being a jarring thing for the troops or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the, the, the last scene is um, what we kind of talked about already, which is uh, Leo man being like, I'm not underestimating them anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go off on my own. I'm going to keep kind of attacking them here and there to figure out their tactics. But now I realize they are a worthy opponent. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. And that's the end of chapter 19. I um, I really had a blast with these two chapters. I really had so much fun with them. Between the, the Scorpion fight and and uh, <laughs> Gorab's various uh, cheatings of death and, um, you know, some of the insight that we got with the Felicins, the various Felicins, Felicin, uh, the older, you know, like having that moment of like getting her senses. You really... I, that in particular to me was a revelation as to the dynamic between Shaikh and Felicin. Like, cause it's always been sort of nebulous, like how they share the soul, how they and, share their consciousness. And whether or not she was like from like square one, her being like, yeah, I'm Shaikh. Like how yeah. much like, we were like, is she literally, is she just acting really hard? Like it wasn't, this is like yeah. the first time it's been clear. Yeah. Uh, any other comments on these uh, these two? No, I don't. I don't think I have any. Probably the only thing that made me laugh, like at the end of this, is you know, I try to think about like what we talked about the previous week, because so yeah. often it's like we'll end on like what feels like a cliffhanger, but it's like it's a book. It's not a cliffhanger. We could have just read further, but we didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and in this case, us being like, who is this third mystery person? And going yeah. from like. Having not read the the words Dasim Altor in I don't know how long to like 15 times in these two chapters. So like, do you remember Dasim Altor, who's the high fist who got killed by the end? I'm like, okay, there he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, so that was like the, the, the my main like takeaway from these chapters that just made me giggle is, is the mystery from last week to the... Oh, it it's seems like it's pretty, uh, yeah. pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> it's not being withheld from us, really. That hard, yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. So we have uh, our favorite sections, our favorite little quotes mm. from uh, these chapters. I think we each have one to share this week. Um, do you want to go first? I do. Mine cool. is super short. I do only have one from this week the context here oh and it was like from like the very beginning okay. um but i do feel like it was sort of a a motif through the rest mm. of this chapter that i really liked um so it's the last line in the flashback to felicin peering at tabore and, and sort of their lives together the stigma of meaning ever comes later like a brushing away of dust to reveal shapes in stone mm. So good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Um, mine is also a, a Felicity moment. Actually, this is a moment we didn't really cover when we were talking about it. We kind of skipped over it. And I think it wor is worth um, talking about just briefly before I even read the quote, which is <clears throat> there is that wonderful sequence where uh, Felicity is fantasizing or Shaikh at that moment, I think, is fantasizing about 
what will happen when she confronts Tavor and she's like, she, I will defeat her. And, oh. and then I will get to that moment where I will pull off my helm and reveal it was your sister all along. You shouldn't have been such a bad sister. And it will feel so good. Um, which I thought was so, um, so telling about, and she even says this thing about how like we have turned this massive uh, conflict that involves gods and and armies and everything. We've turned it into a sibling rivalry. We've turned it into this mm-hmm. this petty conflict that's just between two of us, uh, which I thought was really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, I, I think my, I know what your sentence is. I think I highlighted it and then I unhighlighted it. <laughs> I love this. Um, why did you unhighlight it? Why did I unhighlight it? Because, well, I mean, I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> All right. So um, this is what she's, she's fantasizing um, about what she'll do when she finally has her sister right where she wants her. She says, and then she did not know. A simple execution was too easy. Indeed, a cheat. Punishment belonged to the living, after all. The sentence was to survive staggering beneath the chains of knowledge a sentence not just of living but of living with that was the only answer to everything yeah yes that's exactly exactly the moment that i had highlighted and then unhighlighted Uh, i love it i love it it's like definitely up there in my faves from the chapter but i i unhighlighted it because uh honestly because i don't think i could like sell the delivery not that i sell the delivery but you do oh, i like you. say sentences and you deliver the sentences <laughs> and- i disagree i think we both deliver but i i appreciate you saying that the 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 thing that i loved about that is this notion of you know death is too death is too nice yeah. right is that the, what i i've had to live with this so you're going to have to live with it too mm-hmm. you know her feeling this the the sentence is is not just living but living with like feeling, oh, it's such a beautiful way of expressing it i loved it like feeling feeling the pain the thing that i think is so interesting about this section and like specifically her being like oh, revenge oh, it'll feel so good i want i want that same thought i want to ha- have that same consideration i want to see Felis and think about tavore in hebrex house I want to know how much yeah, of that right. is truly her. Because even when she went into like Hebrick's house, she she was like, Beneth was terrible to me. Yeah, she and has she, this understanding that she hadn't had before. That, yeah. she, that she, she never had. She was, even right. at the very end, she was mad being like, man, you took him away from me. Wah. But, right. and it was like so in, in, infuriating to read. And so- how much of that has been like the whirlwind with her forever? Like, where did that come from? What other poisons did he sort of like eject from her when she, when she crossed those boards? And so I'm so mm. curious to know what part of that is the poison of, of Shaikh of the whirlwind goddess within her versus her true feelings about her sister. I, I'm so curious. I agree. I, that was the most heartbreaking part of that moment was the clarity that she gets, right? Yeah. That, that, realization that oh my gosh so many of the things that i've been thinking were wrong and then he pushes her right back out and she's like what no huh oh no i i went into the room and i had a great time <laughs> with Haboric and he really cleared some things up i don't remember the specifics but yeah, uh, no questions great. no questions yeah no no, no for the <laughs> questions yeah heartbreaking <sighs> uh awesome so next week two more chapters 20 and 21 Hope you're reading along with us. We'll be we'll be fun. We're getting closer and closer to finishing up this novel, and I feel like uh, I I really don't know where we're headed. You know, I, maybe yeah. we're gonna get to that Tavor Felicin Tavor Shaikh head to head. I don't know if that's happening in this novel or not. You, what do you I think? know. I don't. I don't know. I was. I did one of those things. I try not to to think about it, but I, I checked on like what percentage are we through? Because that's the other thing about the Kindle. I'm like. You should yeah. be able to like see how far through the book I am, and yeah, I don't check. I just let myself ride, ride the wave. Um, uh, <laughs> ride the whirlwind. Ride the whirlwind, and I know it's like a big book, 
and I know there's like a quarter of it left, but it still feels like there's too, there's too much. There's too yeah. much. I feel like I wonder, I mean, my, my suspicious brain is like, I wonder if we'll ever get there or something mm. is going to happen. That's going to make this battle not actually occur. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited though. Let's yeah, go. Me too. Me too. All right, folks. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for reading along. Uh, please continue to send us comments, questions. We love hearing from you. DLC feedback at gmail.com is one way to do it. Commenting on the YouTube is another. And being part of our Discord at 5 by 5 DLC on Discord. Great folks hanging out in the, in the book club section there. Um, thank you. We'll see you next week. Until then. When the world feels dark of a place to be And you need an escape from reality Open up those pages and start cry your fantasy Whatever genre you please And join a book club Cause you won't read it on your own Join a book club So you'll be held accountable It's just so mean to them But you're doing it with your friends Love.